Okay, let us begin with our next installment of the Messiah series. We have firmly established that trying to determine when Messiah is coming is a prohibited. There is a severe punishment we learned. You get no portion in Olam Abba. It's part of the actual principle of the Rambam, not to try to forecast or prognosticate. That's A. B, it's futile. God wants it hidden. God wanted the burial place of Moshe to be hidden, in the, and, he, and therefore, even though he gave us three descriptors, no one knows where it is. The Exodus from Egypt, we were given a definitive timeline, but there's enough ambiguity to make room for error. Jacob tried to reveal it. He was unsuccessful. Daniel tried. It is hidden, and the Ramam tells us the precise timing of Messiah is unknown and unknowable with precision. So A, it's prohibited. B, it's futile. And C, it's dangerous. It can lead to very dark places, to heresy, to depression, and to despair. That said, I think we can still outline what we are, in fact, told about what are the features, what are the characteristics, what are the indications that Messiah may be imminent? What are the features of the time of Messiah? What are the features of King Messiah himself? So today I want to go through what our sages tell us, the many, many descriptions of Messiah and the Messianic age of course, we're not going to violate the restrictions against forecasting or prognosticating when Messiah will come, but instead we're going to share what our sages have said about what are the conditions, what are the indications, and what must we know, if they told it to us, obviously we must know it, about Messiah and the Messianic age, what are the elements and what are the characteristics. And again, we can never forget that these can all be misleading. We are told that what we are told about it is deliberately misleading. And there are going to be red herrings and pump fakes and false starts, and there's lots of misdirection, and that's all part of the test. God is going to test us with false messiahs and situations and circumstances and times in history where it seems so obvious that messiahs are on the corner only to have our hopes dashed. Even in Egypt, of course, this is the precursor of all redemption. This is the prototype of all redemption. When Moshe, the savior of the Jews, the greatest prophet ever, when he came initially, and there was this groundswell of excitement for the redemption, it backfired spectacularly. He comes to Pharaoh. And he tries to urge Pharaoh to release the Jews. And instead of having the Jewish slaves have their conditions improved, the conditions are harshened, are made worse. Moshe seems to be another false messiah. And when he came around a second time a few months later, and he tries to rally up the troops again, they didn't even pay attention to him. They had such shortness of breath and they had such despair that Moshe was just not making any headway amongst the nation. And specifically then, they were ripe for redemption. Messiah, like all redemption, it's unexpected. It's a surprise, and we can never forget that. But still, if our sages codified in the Midrash, in the Talmud, in other sources, so much literature about what are the indications of Messiah that is enough proof for us that there is value and importance in those sources for us to know. And therefore, today we're going to strive to explore what our sages said about these matters, again, while studiously avoiding making any predictions or forecasts or prognostications. And we're going to divide up into two parts. First, we're going to talk about the indications of the Messianic era, the generation, the time of Messiah. And then, secondly, we're going to talk about the indications of King Messiah himself, the individual who's going to spearhead 
this grand global transformation. Now, a lot of the ideas will fit in very nicely with some of the ideas that we've already discussed, but hopefully it will further broaden our understanding of this subject, the 12th of the 13 principles of faith of the Rambam, the coming of Messiah. So let's begin with the Messianic era. We are given a very rough breakdown of the history of the world. Now, it's important to note that the subject of the age of the universe and all the worlds that have existed, that's a different subject. When we talk about the world, we talk about the world since Adam. And we read two successive statements in the Talmud, in the book of Sanhedrin on page 97a. Listen very carefully. We read that this world is 6,000 years. And one, i.e. one millennium, Charuv, is destroyed. This world is six millennia, and the seventh millennium, the world is destroyed. And the Talmud furnishes scriptural proof for this from a verse in Isaiah. On that day, God will be alone exalted. There's going to be one day where God is exalted alone. Now, how exactly is this proof for anything that we mentioned? So Rashi tells us, well, the day of God, it's a thousand years for us. Quotes a verse, a thousand years in your eyes, it's like one day. And therefore, if God is alone for one day, one day of God's time, whatever that means, is a thousand years of our time. And therefore, we know that if God's alone, he's exalted alone for one day, that means that for 1,000 years, it's God alone. For a divine day, for us, a thousand years, God's alone, the world is not a factor. Now, what this means, we don't know. But what we do know is that our current world, it's a 6,000-year enterprise. And what happens during the seventh millennium, what happens after the seventh millennium, the seventh divine day, we don't know. Or at least we don't know yet. Okay, continues the Talmud. Abaya, which is another opinion in the Talmud, he says, no, the world's not destroyed for one day, one divine day, one millennium. It's destroyed for two millennia. And he too furnishes scriptural evidence, a verse in Hosea. God will revive us after two days. And on the third day, he will stand us up and we will live before him. So we have two competing timelines. Everyone agrees that this world is 6,000 years. And then there is the seventh millennium, or perhaps the eighth millennium, where there is destruction. And then after that, either the eighth millennium or the ninth millennium, depending on which opinion we follow, there is some version of rebirth of resurrection. And in between, there's this transitory stage between our world and the resurrection, either for one day, one millennium, or for two. Now, I want to point out that the seventh millennium, the eighth millennium, maybe the ninth millennium, that's not our subject. But the sixth thousand years and the sixth millennium is our subject. Now, if you stopped at this juncture in the Talmud, it's not immediately clear what this has to do with Messiah. But the Talmud continues, and it tells us that there are six thousand years in this world, and it breaks it down into three epochs of history. The first two thousand years is tohu, desolation, emptiness, nothingness. The middle two millennia, the middle 2,000 years, is Torah. Torah. And the final 2,000 years is Messiah. And concludes the Talmud, and due to our manifold sins, 
what happened, happened. So here we're given, again, a very rough breakdown of the history of our world. Again, we start from Adam. What happens beforehand is not the subject. And we're going to year 6,000, and what happens afterwards is not our subject. And we're told the first 2,000 years is emptiness, nothingness, devastation, desolation. And then there's 2,000 years of Torah, and then there is 2,000 years of Messiah. Now, Rashi, of course, the first place that we go to for any teaching in the Talmud or in Scripture, he does some calculation for us, and he tells us that if you do the math, Abraham was born 52 years before the end of the first epoch and the beginning of the next epoch. So Abraham signifies or symbolizes the end of the first 2,000 years of desolation and the beginning of the 2,000 years of Torah. And then Rashi tells us that our sages have told us in the Talmud that Abraham started teaching Torah and he started making converts in the land of Haran. And that happened when Abraham was 52 years old. And, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> and thus, precisely on the year 2000, we have this change. Previously, there's no Torah, at least no Torah that's being publicly disseminated. And Abraham is 52 years old, and now he starts teaching Torah to the world. And we have a transformation. The world has changed. No longer is it an empty, desolate world. Now it is a world of Torah. Okay, what about the next epoch of history? So that would be from the year 3000. I'm sorry, from the year 2000 to the year 4000. It's the middle the middle group of years. So Rashi gives us a very long calculation and he tells us that the destruction of the second temple happened 172 years before the year 4000. And therefore, 172 years after the temple was destroyed, that's when we transitioned into the world of Messiah. But due to our sins, our manifold sins, what happened, happened. Meaning that really, just like we have Abraham at the beginning of the 2,000 years of Torah, doesn't miss a day. He's 52 years old. It's exactly year 2000. And right away, we start off with Torah. Due to our sins, we did not have that in the 2,000 years of Messiah. What should have happened is that we begin exactly exactly the year 4,000, and right away we have Messiah. We have some titanic, towering figure akin to Abraham that begins this process of Messiah. But due to our sins, what happened, happened, and Messiah is still not here. So there's a fascinating format here, a template of history, six thousand years, or six divine days, followed by 1,000 years, and it's again millennia and days. And it follows, of course, the format of the week. And Rashi tells us that this is very similar to what we have every week. you got six days, and then you have one day, the seventh day, which is Shabbos. And it's, it's similar more than one way. Our world, it's a very dynamic world. It's a world that has quite a frenetic pace to it. Everyone's hustling and moving and working and innovating and advancing, hopefully, and doing. And Shabbos, well, that symbolizes peace, a certain degree of stasis. It's rest. It's the cessation of all that activity. And that's amplified, that's magnified in the history of the world with the six millennia of this world as it currently currently exists, and the seventh world where it's, it's rest, where the current world ceases to exist, and it's destroyed, whatever that means. So it's very noteworthy. It's not a 
coincidence. So we have 6,000 years, six days, the seventh millennium, the seventh day. And it's a very rough panorama of world history, 2,000 years, 2,000 years, 2,000 years. And this relates to Messiah, evidently, because Messiah's role, as we've seen, that is to prepare for Shabbos. To prepare for what happens once the 6,000 years of this world is over. And therefore, seemingly, it's going to happen before the year 6,000. Let's take this a bit further. There's an incredible essay by the Ramban. So if Rashi is the first place you go to for his commentary on the Torah, on Tanakh, on the Torah, the second place that we go to, the second of the greatest commentators, is the Ramban, Nachmanides, not to be confused with Rambam, Maimonides. At the end of the week of Genesis, so this is the beginning of chapter two of the book of Genesis, the Torah is talking about Shabbos. God finished on the seventh day his work that he did, and he rested on the seventh day, and he blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified the seventh day. Why? This is chapter 2, verse 3. Because on that day, God ceased, God rested, so to speak, from all his work. Asher bara Elohim la'asos. That God created la'asos, to do. Now, if you read this verse very critically, it seems like there's an extra word. It's describing Shabbos. God finished his work. He rested. He ceased to work. He blessed it. He sanctified it. Why? Why did he sanctify it? Because on that day, he rested from all his work that he created, that God created. It adds the word la'asos, to do. And the Ramban's trying to figure out why is there this extra word when it's talking about the, the week of creation. God ceased to do all the work that he did to do. What's that telling us? And he says something unbelievable. The six days of Genesis. Those are days to do. Meaning... That they did not, that it's not this discrete, cordoned off days that are done with, that are in the past. But it's all the days of the world are manifestations of those six days. The six days of Genesis, Ramban tells us, they are the template for the six days of the world, meaning the six millennia of the world. The world, the Ramban tells us, of course, he's quoting the sages, the world is a 6,000-year enterprise. But it's really a six-day enterprise because a day of God is a thousand years for us. And the six days of Genesis, that is the template for what will happen over the course of the six millennia of history. And therefore, the word La'asos tells us that those six days of creation are not just over and done with. They are to do, meaning they are what's going to happen over the course of those six days, i.e. six millennia, history. Fascinating idea. And then he goes day by day, Sunday through Friday, and of course Shabbos as well, goes through the days of creation and shows how what happened in Genesis was manifested over the course of that corresponding millennium. He tells us, the first two days of Genesis, the world was completely covered in water. The first two millennia, it was the two millennia of desolation. There was no Abraham. There was no one to say, let's bring God to this world. There was no one to call out in the name of Hashem. That corresponds to the 2,000 years of emptiness. And even more granularly, on day one, what do you have? The light 
God created light. That's Adam. Adam was the light of the world. Adam lived, we're told, 930 years. So he's effectively the whole first, the whole first millennium. And he knew God. He was the handiwork of God. And the Ramban speculates that there was no idolatry so long as God's own handiwork was around. The world, the whole world, saw the direct handiwork of God, Adam, the light of the world. And so long as he was alive, there was no idolatry. And therefore, Sunday, the first millennium, it was light. Monday, so from year 1000 to year 2000, what do we have? We have the separation of the upper waters from the lower waters. And this indicates that there was a separation. Noah and his sons were separated from the wicked, and the wicked were struck by water. He doesn't say it, but others have. That there was also the generation of the dispersion, the, the separation of humanity. And Tuesday, so from year 2000 to the year 3000, it was a very good day. It was doubly good. On, on Tuesday, the dry land was revealed. And it began to sprout. And it began to produce fruit. And this corresponds to the arrival of Abraham. And he begins to create vitality in the world because he begins to publicize the idea of God in the world. And there's a sprouting. There is a proliferation of faith on Tuesday, i.e. on the third millennium. And Abraham, not only did he himself develop faith and monotheism, but he spread it onwards. The souls that he made in Haran, he taught his children and his future generations to do charity and kindness and righteousness. And there's even more progress. The Torah was given on Tuesday, so to speak, on the third millennium. The temple was built on Tuesday, on the third millennium. And the mitzvahs were fulfilled. These great fruits appeared. He interjects, the Ramban does, with a rule that sometimes the, the day begins a little bit earlier. So Abraham is a Tuesday-ite. He's born at the tail end of Monday. Abraham, like we said, he was 52. When Tuesday began, so he was born in 1948 from Adam, because the, the day begins a little bit earlier. And then on Wednesday, you have the sun, the moon, the stars, and the constellations, and it's described in Scripture as the large and the small constellation that corresponds to the first and the second temple. The first temple is a very bright light. And that indicates the, the presence of God amongst us. And there was fire atop the altar. And the fire in the first temple was like a lion, very bright and very strong. But it was diminished in the second temple, and the fire atop the altar was only like a dog. The big constellation, the sun, and the small one, the moon. And also, the Ramban tells us, just as the moon, it's sometimes it's lit, and sometimes it is not lit, it follows the cycle of the waxing and waning, and then we have a day or two where there's nothing. On Wednesday, we had exile. We had a bright light. And then we had darkness. We lost the light. And towards the evening of Wednesday, these lights set. The temples were destroyed. Now, parenthetically, we have already seen this motif that Messiah is described as the sun. So the idea of the sun coming back, that's what we mean by Messiah. And Messiah also, of course, includes the rebuilding of the temple, and that's the rising of the sun anew. And then on Thursday, we have the birds and the fish. And this is, of course, paralleling year 4,000 to 5,000. And this corresponds to exile and foreign domination. The other nations will dominate us like, like we're animals, like we're under the thumb of our masters. And there's going to be a time over the course of 
this millennium, where there's going to be a proliferation of another religion that's wrong, that's inaccurate. And people won't be seeking God. And the Rabban clearly is hinting at the proliferation of Christianity. And then Friday in the morning, you have the animals. And that's before sunrise. And then with sunrise, you have the creation of man in the image of God. And this corresponds to the two halves of the sec- uh, of the sixth millennium. First, you have the foreign kings, and they're compared to animals who don't submit to God. And he tells us at the beginning of the sixth millennium, you can have a fierce nation that's a bit closer to the truth from the first one that emerged in the previous millennium. Obviously, he's referring to the rise of the Muslims who are closer to the truth than the Christians. And then the Redeemer will come. Messiah, this human, creating the image of God, he will appear on Friday in the sixth millennium, and he ends, day seven is Shabbos, that refers to a different world, to the world to come, a day of rest, and he ends up with a beautiful prayer, which is very unusual. Commentary in the Torah doesn't usually have a prayer in it, where he says, may God protect us during all the days, and may he place our lot amongst those who serve him with perfection. This is a fascinating piece in Ramban. The first week of Genesis, God created La'asos to do. It's a template for the whole world. Six days equals six millennia. And what happened in every day is an indicator of what will happen in the corresponding millennium. Now, for reference, the Ramban lived in the 13th century at the very beginning of Friday. So this is part of our subject, the the timing and the relationship of where we are on Friday, so to speak, corresponding to Genesis. This is a critical element of our subject, and that is the indicators of Messiah. Now, we cannot forget that Messiah can come in two different ways. It can be expedited, and if for any day we can, if we're meritorious, if we're deserving, we can have Messiah, or it can come in its time. And Rashi told us that really Messiah could have come year 4,000, but due to our manifold sins, what happened, happened. If it doesn't come in its time, there's this end point. I'm sorry. If it doesn't come early, then there's this final endpoint, which is Be'ita, in its, in its time, the, the end point, the last time, and that would be very suboptimal. And that last time is sometime on Friday, sometime before year 6,000. This is an incredible Ramban, but it gets even more granular. When we talk about the week of Genesis, and it parallels the arc of history, six days is magnified to six millennia, it goes hour by hour, minute by minute. Whatever happened in Genesis will happen correspondingly in that time in history. Now, of course, we're not given a lot of details about what happened in Genesis. We're told very crude details. It's only, what, 30 verses or so. But we know that if we can figure out what specifically happened each hour, each minute, let's say a Friday, we can perhaps learn more about the future that we are anticipating. Now, helpfully, the Talmud gives us more detail about what happened on Friday. And we know that the day begins with the evening. So there's only 12 hours There's only 12 hours from from daybreak until from from sunrise until sunset. And we're told that Adam was created only during the day, not at night. So not late Thursday night or early Friday morning, only from Friday when it's already light. 
And the Talmud goes through these 12 hours in the book of Sanhedrin on page 38b, and it tells us hour by hour what happened to Adam. Now, it doesn't tell us what happened to anyone else or any other thing during the course of this, the final 12 hours of Friday. But if someone wants to figure out, and we're all curious, and again, this is what our sages are telling us, if someone wants to figure out a little bit more detail about what Friday looks like, perhaps they can look at the hour-by-hour hour breakdown of what happened to Adam on the original Friday, the Friday of Genesis. Now, I could read it to you. We don't know exactly what it means here, and that's, again, another theme here. We could read what our sages are telling us, but, of course, there is a lot more that's hidden and there's a lot more room for blunders. We're told that on the first hour, the earth was gathered. The earth that's going to make up the body of Adam was gathered. And in the second hour, it was formed into a mess. But it was a golem. It was, it was a soulless mess. And then on the third hour, his limbs were stretched out. And on the fourth hour, a soul was thrown into him. And on the fifth hour, he stood up. And on the sixth hour, he gave names to all the animals. And on the seventh hour, he got Eve. And on the eighth hour, they procreated. Two arose to the bed, and four descended from it. And on the ninth hour, he was commanded not to eat from the tree. And on the tenth hour, he sinned. And on the eleventh hour, he was judged. And on the twelfth hour, he was punished. And again, I don't know what any of this means, but we are given, on the final 12 hours of Genesis, we're given the events of every hour. Now, just for our math, if 24 hours of a day correspond to a thousand years of a day of God, about a thousand years for us, that means that every hour of Genesis corresponds to a little more than 41 years. And again, it's not clear what all this means, but it is germane to our subject. And the Gona Vilna tells us that we can determine the precise time that's the end point of Messiah, meaning if it doesn't come in the expedited version of, of history, if we're not meritorious, and that's a very bad situation, as we've seen. It can, and we hope it does, come in an expedited version, and that can be any day. But there's also the time, which is the end point, the final time, and that's sometime on Friday. And there is a way to determine using this system, says the Goan of Vilna, to figure out what happened on, on the Friday of Genesis, now, he doesn't, he doesn't connect the dots for us. You recall, I told you that my grandfather told my father he should live and be well. That if you read all the writings of the Vilna Gon, he says explicitly when Messiah is coming or when the end point. But when the Gon of Vilna does talk about this, he gives a very stern warning to people who do connect the dots to not reveal it. So even if you were to connect the dots, you are advised to not reveal it because the Grown of Vilna adjures you in the name of God to not reveal it. Meaning if you do, you're toast. <laughs> so you, you don't want to violate the, the oath of the Grown of Vilna in the name of God. So, of course, we don't know anything about anything, but the larger idea is sound, and that is that as we get closer to year 6,000, we're getting closer to the final endpoint of Messiah, and just as the preparation for Shabbos intensifies as you get closer to Shabbos, the development of Messiah pitches up steam as we approach the end of the millennium, the end of Friday. Now, I will note something interesting. 
if the 7,000 year format follows the weekly cycle, and sometime on the sixth millennium, from the year 5,000 to the year 6,000, Messiah is going to come. There's also an idea that we must begin Shabbos early. It's a law. Tosefah Shabbos. You have to add to Shabbos. You always have to start Shabbos a bit early. Typically, it's 18 minutes before sunset, which is the earliest start of the next day. I don't know if that has any relevance to this whole subject. I didn't find anyone that mentioned this, but it seems to me that it's perhaps relevant. So this is the first indicator of Messiah. That's just time. There are other indicators, other characteristics, other elements of the pending messianic age. We're told in the Talmud that the quality of the generation will severely diminish, be diminished, in the run-up to Messiah. The Talmud, the book of Sota, page 49b, tells us, Be'ikvos Meshicha, which means literally in the heels or the footsteps of Messiah. Chutzpah, brazenness, temerity, will increase. And prices will increase. And there will be plenty of wine and it's still expensive. And the kingdom will turn over to heresy. And there's no admonishment or rebuke. And again, what this all means, it's not so clear. Rashi talks about some of them. But the larger point is that there's going to be a terrible devolvement. The house of, of the council will turn into a brothel and the Galilee will be destroyed and the Golan will be desolate and the people on the borders will go from city to city and will find no mercy and the wisdom of the scribes will become putrid and those who are fearful of sin will be disdained and truth will be missing and the young, the youth will embarrass the elders and the son will disgrace the father and the daughter will rise up against the mother and the daughter-in-law will rise up against her mother-in-law. The face of the generation is like the face of a dog. The son is not embarrassed of his father. After this whole laundry list of elements that are part of this time period, as we get closer to the end of the exile, concludes the Talmud, on what can we rely upon? On what can we lean? On our father, in heaven. There's a concept called ikvos or ikvasa de meshicha, which means simply the heel of Messiah or the footsteps of Messiah or perhaps literally the heel, the, the lowest level of the body is the heel. Maybe the, the lowest level of the souls are going to be the souls of that generation. Or perhaps it indicates the seizing of the heel of Esau, as we have mentioned in the past, Jacob and Esau, that's this cosmic conflict, and that's this conquest of Messiah, and the finishing of the job is done at the very end by Messiah, and that's symbolized by what happened at the very beginning, where Jacob grabs onto the heel of Esau. And we read about this complete degradation of society, complete breakdown of life in every area, economic, social, ethical, family. It's like the boat is rudderless, the, the ship is captainless. And we're going to be standing before the abyss, and there's no one to turn to, there's no one to rely upon. And we're going to come to the realization there's nothing in the world to rely upon besides for God. Now again, we cannot pinpoint exactly what in our world the Talmud means by all these very specific conditions. But we can certainly see that there's a concept called the heel, the footsteps of Messiah. It seems to be referring to a time at the very end of the latest possible time the Messiah can come. And it's a time of great disenchantment, of great breakdown. And it's going to become clear to all 
that there's no one to rely upon besides for God, all the false gods will crumble and complete total fidelity to the Almighty, to the actual creator and power will be restored. Similarly, we are told that just as by the Exodus, there were less stellar elements of our nation, and there were the mixed multitude who joined us, and they caused all the trouble over the course of the 40 years in the wilderness. The Gona Villa tells us, in the name of the Zohar, in the times of the run-up to Messiah, the leaders of the people for the first time, the shepherds of the people for the first time, will be those elements of society, the absolute lowest of the low, those mixed multitude, they will be the leaders. Now again, draw your own conclusions, but we know for the last you know, 100, 200 years, there's been a rise of mixed multitude-like leaders of the Jewish people for the first time in history. What that means, I don't know. There are sources, maybe we'll talk about this more if we get the opportunity, that juxtapose the triumph of the pauper riding the donkey. It juxtaposes that to the kingdom of the camel. And that seems to imply that the Ishmaelites who, you know, the Arabians, who ride the camels, they are going to be part of this Messianic era. That after the rise of the Ishmaelites, so to speak, the camel riders, there will be the rise of the donkey rider, namely Messiah. We have seen in the past that Messiah's arrival is somehow connected to Shemitah on the seventh year or on the eighth year, maybe the wars are going to happen on year seven. But all these things, and there are more, all these descriptions of, of the breakdown of life seems globally and certainly nationally as well. The pain, the difficulties, the degradations, the travails before Messiah, that's part of this process. It's also called, interestingly, the birth pains of Messiah. And that's why, and that's because Messiah is compared to childbirth. Just as with childbirth, there's the ushering in of something completely novel to the world, something totally unexpected. You know, if you were an alien dropped in to witness the birth of a child, unless you've been trained to know what's about to happen, you would never guess that a woman in the throes of labor is about to birth a brand new human baby. It's a very painful experience, and it gets even more painful as things get closer, and only once she reaches the absolute climate of pain and discomfort, only then does the new baby show up out of nowhere. I would perhaps venture to say when a woman's expecting, even before the labor begins, there are some indicators as well. You can make up some sort of contours, if you know what I mean, that there's maybe reason to expect a baby to be coming. Of course, it's advisable to not make those thoughts public, I've been told. <laughs> don't, don't say, uh, when's the baby due, per se. But there are there is the the swelling notion, if you will, that the baby's coming close. It's imminent. But then it gets really, really, really painful, unbearably so. And all that's this preparation for the wonderful revelation of this new life. Now there is, if you will, an epidural. There is a way to avoid this pain. The Talmud tells us 
in the book of Shabbos on page 118, that if someone fulfills the mitzvah of three festive banquets on Shabbos, they are saved from three punishments. The war of Gog and Magog, the punishment of Gehenom, and Mechevlo Shel Mashiach, and from the birth pains of Messiah. So if there's childbirth and it's painful, there's an epidural, and the Talmud tells us that that is to fulfill the three festive banquets on Shabbos. What the connection is, I don't know. But again, we're trying to figure out the indications of Messiah, and now we see another element to this question. And again, although we don't prognosticate, and we don't play prophet, and point to phenomena, and declare, oh, that's a harbinger of Messiah or the Messianic age. But our sages did provide us with some indications of the Messianic era, what potentially are the conditions in which Messiah will come, and that is what we outlined until this point. And that's with respect to the Messianic era, Messianic age. What about with respect to Messiah himself, the individual? Regarding Messiah himself, we are also given some indicators. And again, this will complement some of what we discussed previously in this series about Messiah and the persona of Messiah. Of course, we've already talked about this, the descriptions of Messiah, the Talmud says that he's a leper sitting on the outskirts of Rome, wrapping and unwrapping his bandages one at a time. And we're, we talked about the superlative greatness, the character profile of, of Messiah. He's a prophet, almost like Moshe. He's wise even beyond Solomon. He's more elevated than the angels and the Abraham. We'll have to deal and negotiate with all the kings, not just with Pharaoh. He's a pauper riding on a donkey. That is what... Messiah is described as. And it should just tell us that there are three great people who ride the same donkey. And these are, of course, Abraham, Moshe, and Messiah. And we know that there are three eras of history. There's the era of desolation and of Torah and of Messiah. 2,000 years, 2,000 years, and 2,000 years. And the three paramount figures of these three epochs of history are Abraham, Moshe, and Messiah. And they all have this quality of riding a donkey. Now, what does this mean? So the sources offer a variety of explanations. And of course, these are not mutually exclusive, but these two are indicators of Messiah himself. Rashi tells us that riding a donkey is a symbol of Humility. Messiah will be humble, will be unpretentious. We're also told that riding a donkey, having the reins to the donkey, is symbolic of Messiah's complete mastery over his innate physicality. There's going to be separation of rider and animal. For most of us, for all of us, our physicality and our spirituality are commingled. Abraham, Moshe, Messiah, these three pivotal transformational figures, they ride the donkey. They are in complete control of their physicality. Other sources tell us that this symbolizes the domination of other nations. Ishmael, we're told, is compared to a donkey, and if Messiah is riding the donkey, it means that he has control of the donkey. Alternatively, we know that the, the one tribe that is most associated with immersive Torah study is the tribe of Issachar, and he's compared to, in the blessings of Jacob at the end of his life, in Genesis chapter 49, He's compared to a, a donkey that's laden with Torah, carrying voluminous Torah. And Messiah, we're told, will come in the merit of Torah. So these are other indications about the individual Messiah. We also 
learned that Messiah will be able to smell and judge. He's going to be able to sniff things with great prophetic accuracy. And we also learned that this is not necessarily something supernatural. This is the full manifestation of the power, the sheer power of the human soul and this very lofty soul without any inhibitions or restrictions. Messiah, we're told, and again, it's hard for us to actually know what this means or how to identify it. But Messiah, we're told, the soul of Messiah is the soul of Adam, or Adam and David, and Messiah is one soul. And that's uh, Adam, David, and Mashiach is the first letter of each of those three names, is Adam. And that's why Adam donated 70 years of his life to to David, because David is Messiah. And Adam is also Messiah, whatever that means. Other sources attribute the soul of Messiah to Moshe. And again, we don't know what anything here means, but we are told about this incredible soul that Messiah is going to possess. Now, these ideas we've talked about in the past, but I want to introduce some more ideas, some more elements, some more indicators that will help us understand more about who Messiah actually is himself and what are the messianic indicators. The Midrash tells us that although Messiah comes from the Davidic line, which is the tribe of Judah, that's only from his father's side. From his mother's side, Messiah comes from the tribe of Dan. Now, for us, this means that the characteristics of Dan, as well as the characteristics of Judah, are going to be manifested in Messiah. So we typically think of Messiah as a, as a king, and Judah's the king, David's the king, and Solomon's the king, and that's Messiah. But we're also told that Dan is, is the other half, so to speak, of this of this individual. Now, in his blessing to his sons, chapter 49 of Genesis, Jacob revealed to them their characteristics and their destiny. So, of course, Judah was about the monarchy and hinted to David and to Solomon and to Messiah. But then in chapter 49, verses, I think, 16, 17, 18, Jacob addresses Dan. And he compares Dan to a snake. Dan will be a snake upon the way, a viper upon the path. And Dan is going to bite, or this, this snake is going to bite the heels, heels, that gets our attention, the heels of the horse, and the rider of the horse falls off backwards. Dan is compared in the blessing of Jacob to a snake that bites the heel of the horse and causes the horse to rear up and to chuck the rider off of it. Rashi tells us that this reveals that Dan is able to kill the rider without touching the rider. And typically, you know, if you want to kill something, you have to have some sort of point of contact with that thing. Dan's like the snake. He's able to impact the rider without ever touching it. And Rashi tells us that this is a prophecy about Samson. Samson killed the enemies of Israel without touching them. He just pushed the pillars of the building and that collapsed the whole building. But if Messiah has, from his mother's side, the elements of Dan, this may be another indicator of Messiah himself, and that is that the impact that he's going to have may be indirect. The sources maintain that unlike David, Messiah will not need weapons to gain the fealty the loyalty of others. Messiah will not need to use 
force to gain acceptance. His impact will be indirect. It's going to ripple throughout the world without necessarily having a touch point, a physical touch point. There's something about Dan that's manifested in Messiah, just as the viper indirectly affects the rider of the horse, Messiah will indirectly affect the whole world. There is a cool gematria, if you're into gematrias, the Hebrew word for, for snake is nachash, and that's precisely the gematria of Mashiach. There's another part of the association with Dan that's relevant to Messiah. We know that Dan had only one son, a boy named Chushim, who was deaf. And the Midrash tells us that Chushim was actually the one who killed Asaf. He actually beheaded Asaf, decapitated him. We know the story. Jacob died in Egypt, and then he was embalmed in Egypt, and then Joseph got permission from Pharaoh to bring him back to the land of Israel to bury him in the cave of the patriarchs. This is the very end of Genesis. The Midrash tells us that when they got to Hebron, to Hebron, and they went to inter Jacob in the cave of the patriarchs, Asaph was there. And he didn't allow the funeral procession to proceed. And they said, well, you sold your rights. There's only one barrel spot. And Asaph claimed it for himself. And he says, well, Jacob buried Leah here. The last one is mine. But they said, no, you, you sold it. When, when Jacob went down to Egypt, he made a transaction with Esav, he made a big pile of all the gold and all the possessions that he acquired out of the land of Israel. And he exchanged it with Esav for Esav's portion, burial portion, in the cave of the patriarchs. But then Esav says, well, where is the documentation? Show me the proof. And they said, oh no, we forgot the contract in Egypt. So they sent Naphtali to go hustle back to Egypt to go retrieve that contract. Meanwhile, I was waiting around, and it's a terrible disgrace to Jacob that he's not being allowed to be buried. Now, Hushim is deaf, so he's not really following the proceedings, but he realizes that something is amiss here. So he communicates with everyone, saying, well, what's going on? So they point him, well, this guy, Asaph, he is preventing the burial from happening. Hushim gets enraged. And there are different versions of what happened. Either he bludgeoned Asav to death, or he beheaded Asav, and Asav's head rolled into the cave. And with Asav eliminated, they were able to bury Jacob. And Asav's head remained buried there and the rest of his body was buried elsewhere. Now, if Dan only had one son, and the mother of Messiah comes from Dan, that means that Messiah comes not only from Dan, but also from Hushim. Now, it is noteworthy, the Kabbalists point out. The word Hushim is spelled Ches Shin Yud Mem. If you scramble those letters, you have Mem, Shin, Yud, Ches, that's Messiah. So not only is Hushim the same gematria as Messiah, it's the same letters. And just as Hushim smote Esav, as we mentioned, the last frontier, the last battle before Messiah is the battle on Mount Seir against Esav, the final grabbing of the heel. And Dan and Hushim and Messiah, part of this whole story is the coming out of nowhere to destroy Esau 
and to clutch his heel and to overtake him. Now, perhaps there's another wrinkle to this. Hushim is a great hero for what he did. He restored the honor of, of Jacob. But why was Hushim the only one who ended Jacob's disgrace and killed Esau? How come no one else did that? What about the rest of the family? Why did no one else stand up for the honor of Jacob? You had Judah there, Joseph there, lots of people there. Why did only Hushim take the necessary steps? So there are many answers to this question. But one of them, I think, is germane to our subject. Esau didn't come there alone. When he met Jacob, he had 400 men, warriors. He knew that if he were to block the burial of Jacob, that would not be taken kindly by Jacob's descendants. So he had guards, and they were armed to the teeth, and they were protecting Esau. They expected trouble, and they prepared accordingly. There was only one person that they did not deem a threat. Khushim, he's deaf, he's out of it. That was not one of the people that the bodyguards of Asaph, so to speak, were worried about. So they had their eyes on Joseph and on Judah and everyone else. But Hushim, that kid who doesn't seem to have really anything going for him, that's not a threat. And perhaps this is another element of Messiah. Like Hushim, Messiah is unexpected, perhaps the least expected place that it were, it were to come from. So again, we don't know what this all means, but we are told that Messiah, part of Messiah, one of the qualities, one of the elements of Messiah, the individual, is the Dan, and by extension, the Hushim element, and that too is an indicator of Messiah. There's another larger theme about Messiah, and this is slightly related to what we just spoke about, and that is the inauspicious beginnings of Messiah. We're told a lot, no pun intended, about the lineage, about the pedigree of Messiah. And it's not sterling. In fact, it's quite checkered. If you were to just study the the unions that serve as forbearers of Messiah, it's quite uncomfortably scandalous. So, of course, we have Lot and his daughters. After Sodom and Gomorrah is overturned, Lot and his two surviving daughters, they are under the impression that the world is over, and therefore they have no choice but to procreate with dad. And on successive nights, Lot is plied with alcohol, and he spends some time with his daughters. The elder daughter produces a son named Moab. It doesn't seem to be immediately relevant. This is the, the forebearer of the Moabite nation. But we know that one Moabite is Ruth. And Ruth is the great-grandmother of David, and thus the progenitor of David, of Solomon, and of Messiah. So if we look back at the genealogy, at the ancestry of David, it does include, David and by extension Messiah, it does include that very, very unpleasant union. In addition, it also includes the other very unpleasant and quite scandalous union of Judah and his daughter-in-law Tamar. We remember the story. Judah has three sons, and the oldest one marries Tamar, and then he dies. And the second one says, okay, I'll marry her, and then he dies. And Judah says, well, this, this woman is trouble. 
and he sends her back home and she really wants to have a baby from the family of Judah. So she impersonates a prostitute and seduces Judah. It's a crazy story. And Judah doesn't know who she is, gives her some identifying possessions of him. And she becomes pregnant and he thinks that she's guilty of a capital crime. And at the last second, she's spared and she gives birth to twins. One of them is Peretz. Peretz is the great-grandfather of Boaz, the great-grandfather of David, and thus the great-grandfather, so to speak, of Messiah. Now, Ruth herself, the verse tells us that a Moabite is not allowed to intermarry amongst the Jewish people. A Moabite could convert they could become Jewish, but they cannot intermarry. And therefore, if they do intermarry, then the, the stain, so to speak, of being not allowed to join the congregation of God continues indefinitely. And thus, is Ruth even allowed to intermarry amongst the Jewish people? She was a convert, of course. But she was a Moabite convert. Now the verse tells us that well, Lo Yavo Amoni U Moavi. If you read it very, very precisely, it says a male Moabite. But that was only clarified in the times of Samuel. And thus, when, when Ruth and Boaz produced a child, there was a very credible argument that this child is not allowed to partake amongst the Jewish people. And thus, Oved's son, Jesse, Jesse's son, David, Solomon, and Messiah, there was at least a credible argument to be made that they are not legitimate. Oh, and then you have David and Bathsheba. And that's a scandalous story. All this is part of the genealogy, the pedigree of, of Messiah. Now, David himself, this is not as well known. In very reputable sources, we're told that David's family thought that David was a bastard. And that's why when Samuel came to coronate one of the sons of Jesse, we don't know which one, make a list. There's seven of them. Well, none of them, are the, these are not the people. Well, okay, there's this eighth one, but we don't think he's your guy. No one thought he was a candidate. Why not? So the sources tell us. They all thought that David was not the son of Jesse. He was a bastard. How so? Jesse, for very good reasons, you have to trust me on this, for very good reasons, summoned his maidservant to be with him. This maidservant, according to the sources, is a reincarnation of Hagar, put that aside. She told Mrs. Jesse, i.e. the mother of Jesse's children, about Jesse's plan. Jesse had separated from his wife for many years. And now Jesse's telling his maidservant, I want to spend time with you. She tells Mrs. Jesse, his wife, and she impersonates the maidservant, and swaps her garments out and sneaks in with Jesse and becomes pregnant. Now, Jesse has separated himself from his wife for years, and she's pregnant. What does that mean? It means that, well, if he's not the dad, someone else got to be the dad. And thus, well, that child's a bastard. And Jesse tells his sons, we have a problem here. Mom 
is pregnant and I'm not the dad. And the sons wanted to kill her, certainly to kill the baby. And Jesse said, no, if you do that, then people will say that you're also not legitimate. But just let this baby be born and he'll be like your servant. We'll make him a shepherd. He's not really part of the family. That's why David is kind of like unwelcome. He's ostracized. Persona non grata amongst this family. And Samuel comes and says, okay, one of your sons, one of your sons is the next king. And Jesse lines up his seven known sons and says, no, it's none of these. And they never think to bring David there because they think that Jesse's not the father. Only then does Samuel reveal what happened. Samuel the prophet says, no, no, <laughs> Jesse, David is your son. He's not a bastard. But everyone was under the impression that he was until that point. And again, this seems very, very, very sketchy. And this is, again, a pattern that we see again and again and again of all the known parents of antecedents of David and thus Messiah. We see this incredible pattern of scandal and controversy. The progenitors of Messiah don't seem to be standard, following protocol, being very orthodox in their behavior. This is not a coincidence. And there are a variety of reasons for this. One idea is that Tama tells us any great leader must have some skeletons in the closet, must carry a basket of rodents around their neck. Because to be a leader, you have to be humble. And you cannot lord over your constituents. And therefore, if you come from a very checkered past, you don't have this sterling background, you're actually better qualified to be a leader. That's one idea. Another idea, again, these are more elaborate subjects. Another another idea is that if you want to have a very, very, very holy soul, the ilk of, of David and Messiah and Solomon, etc., you must use a back door, so to speak. There are forces that are determined, that are created to try to prevent David, Solomon, Messiah from emerging. You got to use subterfuge. You got to hide this, so to speak, in the most scandalous way possible. That's the only way you could sneak it by, past, so to speak, the watchful eye of the Satan, whatever that means. Now, again, these are other subjects, but regardless, this gives us another clue about what sort of person perhaps Messiah will be, not necessarily some cookie cutter candidate. David, again, there are so many reasons that you would have argued David, David is not only not a candidate, but maybe the least qualified candidate, and that is David, Mashiach Hashem, the Messiah of God. He is descendant, maybe even someone who bears his soul, perhaps will likewise be very unexpected. My grandfather, of blessed memory, used to say that he thinks that Messiah could be a Balchuva, someone who grew up not Torah observant and came to it later in life and abandoned their previous life. Maybe they can teach the whole world about what it means to become close to Hashem. If you think about it, you know, we talked about these three giants who ride the donkey, who symbolize this, this triumvirate that symbolize these three epochs of history we know two of them. We know Abraham and Moshe. Abraham, his father, was the biggest wholesaler of idols in the world. He himself, we're told, worshipped idols as a child. And where did Moshe grow up? Of the whole nation, you would point at Moshe and say he's the least likely candidate to be the leader of the Jewish people. He grew up with Pharaoh as his dad. 
He's going to save us from Pharaoh? If that's the pattern with those first two of this triumvirate, you can perhaps at least expect or understand this uh, other idea that Messiah perhaps may come from very surprising, very unexpected, very inauspicious origins. Now we're told that every generation has a potential Messiah. If Messiah can come any day, that means that there is someone any day that would qualify. I don't imagine he's still sitting at the outskirts of Rome, but that, that, that candidate would be quite unexpected, you would imagine. A leper on the outskirts of Rome? Where that person would be today, of course, we don't know. But interestingly, the Rambam tells us, and this is more in line with that previous idea, that Messiah will be unknown until he reveals himself and demonstrates his qualifications. Other sources tell us that Messiah himself, not just will be unknown to the masses, but he himself won't know that he's Messiah. And just like Moshe. Moshe didn't know ahead of time that he was destined to save the nation. God tells him, by the burning bush, you're going to save the nation. And he spends a whole week launching multiple objections against this notion. Messiah, likewise, we're told, will be unaware of this task, of this great task before him ahead of time. One final idea, and that is the name of Messiah. The Talmud lists seven things that were created before the world. They preceded the world. Torah, number one. Repentance, number two. Ganadin, number three. Gehenom, number four. The throne of God, the throne of glory, number five. The holy temple. And finally, Vishmo Shel Mashiach, and the name of Mashiach, the name of Messiah. What does that mean? The name of Messiah? It doesn't say Messiah, it says the name of Messiah. So simply put, it means that his identity, we don't know who he is, his name. How do I find him? What's his name? I don't know. Simply put. The Maharal, as he always does, gives us a very, very deep idea as to what it means, the name of Messiah. People have different names. Why do people have different names? What's the purpose of a name? A name, Maharal tells us, is a differentiator. It differentiates between person A and person B. There's Reuven and there's Shimon. They're two different people. What the name symbolizes is what separates one person from another. Messiah is going to be different. His greatness, his stature, his distinction above other creations is different. And his name, i.e., his differentiator, maybe different differentiators, what makes him distinct and different, that is something which is from a different world. And thus we talk about you know, Messiah, greater than Moshe on some level, greater than Abraham, greater than the angels. That distinction of Messiah, the name, the differentiator of Messiah, Messiah that is something which is created before the world was created and is unknown to us. Along these lines, the Talmud tells us that there was a whole discussion. Well, what is Messiah's name? And the students of Rab Shila, they said, well, his name was Shila. And the students of Rabbi Yanai said, well, his name is Yanai. And the students of Rabbi Hanina said his name was Hanina. And others say his name was Menachem. All the students of a given sage said, well, I think his name is the same name as their, their teacher. The notion that the students slash followers believe that their Rebbe, their leader is Mashiach, it's not a new one. But there's another idea, also courtesy of Maharal. Again, a much deeper idea. The students of Rabbi Shila thought it was Rabbi Shila. And Rabbi Yanai, Rabbi Hanina. Why? They studied Messiah. And they found incredible qualities of Messiah. And they found those qualities within themselves. And therefore they said, well, maybe I'm the right man. 
And every sage found in their study of Messiah the qualities of Messiah that they already had. And therefore they said, well, look, I have the qualities. But perhaps what they did not realize was the Messiah had the qualities of all these sages because he had the qualities of everyone. He's this incredible figure, this superlative figure that encompasses within him all the qualities. And therefore everyone finds his name, i.e. his qualities, in Messiah because, well, Messiah's got that as well. So again, what this tells us is that Messiah is, is this individual this king that's so completely beyond what we can fathom, even though we have studied a lot about the indications of Messiah, both the Messianic age, the Messianic era, and Messiah himself, it remains hidden. The name of Messiah, the timeline of Messiah, the generation of Messiah, the arrival of Messiah, it's hidden. It's a surprise. And we have to remember, we don't know. And we feel compelled to try to find out. And it's futile. And yesterday we learned some of the characteristics, some of the indicators of Messiah. But ultimately we must remember that great people were misled in the past about this subject. And we too can be misled. And I think it's important for us to study some of the previous mistakes that people made in this area. Because in this area, Messianic prognostication, being so certain you know who Messiah is, it's an area that's rife for blunders. We have a penchant for making these types of mistakes. As part of the story of Messiah, you recall that Rambam, when he talks about the qualifications of Messiah, he invokes that Rabbi Akiva, greater than any of us will ever become, Rabbi Akiva thought that Bar Kokhba was Messiah. He made a mistake, or on some level he made a mistake. Obviously, Bar Kokhba proved to not be Messiah. But that story is important for us to know. And therefore, what I want to do next, please God, is to explore the sad and unfortunate history of false messiahs and perhaps unrealized messiahs throughout the ages. It's a secret. It's hidden. It's a surprise. And yes, we are told about the indicators of messiah. And it's important for us to know that, obviously. But nevertheless, we will wait and yearn and anticipate for the real Messiah to come, please God, speedily in our days. I appreciate your attention. It's great to talk to you from the Torch Center in Houston, Texas. And as always, my email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. I look forward to your questions, your comments, and your feedback.